In a moment, I'm going to be introducing you to one of the most powerful and famous and knowledgeable people in the cryptoverse. And this is the first of a series of three interviews. And in this very first interview, wait till you see what we cover. We're going to cover exactly what the blockchain is, exactly what Monkey Ball is doing on the blockchain. It's a brand new game. And you're going to learn exactly what Bitcoin is and how you can get more Bitcoins. Right now, there's 18 and a half million Bitcoins in circulation, and there's never going to be more than 21. But what you're going to learn is 3 million have already been lost. Where did they go? You've got to find out. And you'll learn the difference between coins and shares, which would be traded on a stock market exchange. You're going to learn why Ethereum is so slow and you won't believe his answer. And you'll learn why sports clubs and cities are actually issuing tokens, NFT tokens. And you'll learn what layer two is. And it, you think it's technical, but it's not. Our guest is going to explain it so well that you'll understand for the first time what layer two solutions are. And finally, he's going to explain why the island country of Barbados has opened an embassy in the metaverse. And he explains, is it a joke? Is it just a publicity stunt or is it real? Stay tuned for the first of three fascinating interviews with this expert on crypto. Hello, and yes, this is the Meta Man bringing you another issue of the Meta Man Rocks. And I have with me Robert Rowley, who is the author of the runaway international bestseller, The Million Dollar Decision, which is about the one specific mistake that practically everybody makes in the stock market. And not only is he an expert in the stock market, he's also an expert in crypto. And he was actually my first coach clearing away all the weird mysteries of this strange new world. So Robert, it is totally appropriate for you to be the very first person that I am interviewing on this particular YouTube channel. Welcome, 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 I'm honored. Thank you, Raymond, uh, for inviting me. It's a great honor to be here. Okay, so here we go. The first thing I want to know is, what the heck is the blockchain? I hear <laughs> about the blockchain. I hear about the blockchain, but I don't know what it is. And when I study it, I get this complicated scientific analysis that there are blocks and they each point to the one before and the one after, but that doesn't help me because I don't know what a coin is that's on the blockchain. So don't tell me the scientific explanation. Yeah. Give me an example of a coin that operates on the blockchain so I can understand it. Yeah, maybe the best analogy that I ever heard uh, what the blockchain is uh, was written by Fabricio Santos. Um, he describes a bank vault, okay, a big bank vault. Uh, and in this bank vault, there are rows and rows of unlabeled glass boxes, okay? So there are a lot of glass boxes. And everyone in the bank can see the contents of these boxes, you know? However, uh, they cannot access these boxes, okay? Only an individual who owns the keys to a specific box can access this, uh, this glass box. And this is basically the underlying technology for all the crypto projects, uh, coins, you know, tokens, and so on. So um, you basically have a key <clears throat> to a glass box. Everybody can see what is happening with uh, the coins in your, uh, let's say, uh, wallet or, or vault or, whatever, or, or glass box. Uh, and everything is transparent and everybody knows what, uh, whatever is happening there. Okay, so it's basically a digital ledger uh, that is totally transparent and very secure, and everybody knows uh, what is uh, going on with these coins and so on. I know you're enjoying this presentation, so this is your opportunity to reciprocate and make sure you subscribe and make sure that you like this particular video. 
and make sure you comment because I respond to all my comments and make sure you share. Please do that. Subscribe, like, comment, share. That's our deal. I'll make great videos for you and you like and comment and share and subscribe. So give me an example. There's a, a game that just started in December called Monkey Ball. It's the only one that I know of that is soccer based. In the United <laughs> States, everyone is all excited about baseball and football and hockey and basketball, but around the entire world, it's soccer. And this little game, only a couple months old, uh, stars monkeys who have more yeah. maneuverability than humans. Okay, fine, it's a game. But what do you mean it's a game on the blockchain? What does that mean? That just means that um, everything that happens in the game is basically verifiable. Um, all the people who are playing can be very, very certain that uh, everything is legit and that, uh, you know, when, when somebody scores a point, that is the, that's the, the real thing, uh, that nobody is making things up. And also, you know, um, some games are uh, so-called play-to-earn games. So basically, you can play and you can earn uh, tokens or money. And uh, for these transactions, you know, you basically need some kind of transparency. You need that everything is uh, verifiable and so on. And uh, the blockchain makes sure that, uh, this, uh, uh, that this is happening all the time, that everybody can be sure that everything is legit and transparent and so on. All right. All right. Now, the first coin that opened up this entire universe was Bitcoin. Yeah. And it didn't start until 2013. That's only nine years ago, for gosh sakes. And as far as I know, it doesn't do anything. <laughs> it just sits there like gold sits there. But if I had to flee, I'd rather take some ephemeral Bitcoin that doesn't weigh anything rather than a couple tons of gold. But I also understand that Bitcoin is a formula or a calculation and that people solve the equation, which is also called mining. So please explain what Bitcoin is and what mining is. Mm -hmm. So the easiest way to understand Bitcoin is basically uh, an analogy that this is a digital gold. Okay, It's very scarce. There, there will ever be only 21 million Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoins and nobody can print more Bitcoin. OK, uh, for example, our uh, our governments or central banks can print more Canadian dollars and more US dollars and more British pounds and so on. But nobody can print more Bitcoin. Uh, Bitcoin can only come so new Bitcoin. So there, there is a limit, strict limit of 21 million Bitcoin, but not all of them are right now in existence. So the mining Bitcoin mining is just a process how this um, how this digital coin uh, comes into existence okay so there are a lot of computers solving very difficult equations and so on and um, this means that they are producing new bitcoin but when there will be 21 million bitcoins stops okay from then on um, uh, no mining will be possible and the the miners will be only getting rewards because they are verifying the the transactions you know in the bitcoin network so for now new bitcoins are coming into existence but soon um okay soon <laughs> maybe in the, in uh, 20 years time uh, there will be no new bitcoin coming onto the market but i understand that they can go in the other direction bitcoins can be lost i understand yeah that if I am not careful transferring Bitcoins from one of my wallets to one of my own wallets or sending it as a gift to somebody, if I make one little mistake in sending it, that my Bitcoin or any, any coin will just disappear into somewhere. So explain okay, that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, this is the tricky part, you know, about the blockchain and all the transactions and Bitcoin and stuff. Um, the thing is that if you for example, store your Bitcoin on a special digital wallet. And if you lose the keys, if you lose the, uh, if you lose the passwords, then there is no way to retrieve this Bitcoin. Okay. Or if you send Bitcoin to the wrong address, 
there's no way that you can get it back. back okay. So um, for now, there are approximately three million bitcoins out of twenty-one million um, that, that there will ever be in the existence. There, there, there are already three million bitcoins that were lost. You know, and there's no way to get them back. <laughs> so in reality, uh, there, there, there will, uh, there are not twenty-one million bitcoins, but for now, let's say eighteen million because three million has has been lost. Three million have been lost. Yeah, well, I had no idea that anyone knew how many, or that three million out of twenty-one. This is million. just, this is just uh, uh, you know, uh, some kind of approximation. You know, it's not the real number, but you know, uh, they think it's around three million. But three million out of twenty-one million—that's that's a, a very lot. large number. Yeah, yeah. Well, and this is also, you know, one of the one of the reasons. Uh, why Bitcoin uh, is gaining in value, you know, um, in, in the short run, of course, it has a lot of uh, volatility, it can go up and down by 50% in, in a couple of uh, weeks or months. Uh, but in the long run, I think that there is a very high probability that Bitcoin in the long run will go up and up and up and up, you know, with ups and downs, you know, um, in, in, uh, in, in the short run. Now, if I wanted to have a publicly traded company, then I would incorporate, and then I would have to hire probably hundreds of people, and then I would have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on legal fees and governance in order to get myself listed on a major stock exchange, the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ. But I played a YouTube video in which some guy actually created a coin in under five minutes, and it could be traded, it could be legitimate, and it could actually become a major coin in just minutes and no cost whatsoever. That's, it seems strange. It, shouldn't there be a threshold? Shouldn't I have to do something to have a coin more than just spend a few minutes and no money? Yeah, the thing is that uh, uh, anybody can create a coin, but these coins are worthless. You know, uh, most of these coins are worthless. Uh, because if you want to have a real value, uh, you need to create some kind of project uh, behind it, behind this coin, uh, that will really uh, utilize this coin. So, for example, Ethereum uh, or ETH, um, it's, it's a network uh, where smart contracts, you know, uh, can run on this network. So this means that you can program uh, the uh, the Ethereum network, so you can you can build apps on it, okay, just like in in uh, Apple Store or in Play Store uh, for Android. Uh, so basically, Ethereum is like some kind of operating system where apps can be developed on top of this uh, of this platform, okay, and that is why Ethereum has value. But there are thousands and thousands of some small coins, you know, that do nothing. Um, and uh, these are basically worthless. Uh, sometimes people think that they will succeed, you know, but uh, if there is nothing behind them, uh, they will gravitate towards zero, of course. But yeah, it's, it's easy and sim it's simple and easy to create new coins, but this doesn't mean that they have value, you know. And I believe that in the future, a lot of things will be tokenized. So this means that they will have their own coins. So for example, um, a lot of um, sports clubs already have their tokens. Uh, a lot of communities already have their, their tokens and so on, you know. So a lot of things in the future will be, will be uh, tokenized. Give me an example of a city or a sports team yeah, there are a lot of, uh, for example, Barcelona football club, uh, or uh, there are a lot of uh, football clubs in uh, in Europe that uh, that have, uh, created their own token, and uh, these tokens are trading on different platforms. Wow. Uh, so uh, you can buy them, you can sell them, uh, and uh, they are gaining value if uh, your sports team is, is successful, if it gets some sponsors and so on. So it's a very interesting, um, uh, interesting um, way how to build community around a, a sports club. And I think that this is the future. You know, this is the future uh, for a lot of communities, for a lot of, you know, also um, um, digital art, you know, uh, art is becoming tokenized. Uh, through NFTs and stuff like this now. So yeah, the future is uh, is tokenized, the future is, is digital. <laughs> so you brought up Ethereum and I have a question. I am communicating with you on my laptop and I have a cell phone right here. Mm -hmm. And my laptop or my cell phone 
are able to do millions of transactions a second. It's actually quite amazing, but we've gotten used yeah. to it. How come Ethereum, the big exalted Ethereum, the second biggest coin in the whole cryptoverse, can only do 13 transactions in a second? <laughs> Heck, an abacus can do better than that. Yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, it's really fun, you know. But this is because of um, when it was designed. Ethereum was designed in 2015, and at that time, probably nobody expected uh, that Ethereum will become so popular. So um, the congestions on the network are because Ethereum is so popular, and a lot of developers are developing applications, apps on Ethereum network. Uh, so there is a lot of demand for this uh, network space or um, uh, yeah for, for this network space and that is why uh, it's it's becoming very congested and slow uh, but of course uh, just like with any technology um, there are already solutions that are solving this and in the future of, of course ethereum 2.0 uh, will um, increase um, sharply this uh, trans uh, the, the the number of transactions per per second that can be uh, that can be run on this network um, all the time. So uh, the solutions will come. Okay, it's just because uh, probably nobody expected when they created Ethereum that it would become so popular and that uh, a lot of these use cases will be uh, will be uh, on Ethereum. I never heard that explanation. Thank you. So let me see if I got this explanation right for the layer two solutions. Instead of Ethereum doing the calculation itself, which it gets bogged down, what it does is delegate the transaction or delegate the calculation to another coin. And so off the Ethereum blockchain, the calculation gets done and then sent back. And so okay. it saves Ethereum the effort of doing that calculation. And there's all kinds of so-called layer two solutions that are inviting Ethereum to give them their work and then they'll return it correctly. Did, yeah. did I have that accurate? Yeah, you got it. You got this right. Uh, like I said, um, for now, these layer two solutions uh, are helping Ethereum uh, to, uh, to, to survive, you know, these, uh, these uh, congestions and a lot of demand and so on. But uh, in the future, uh, the Ethereum 2.0 will come. But some people are saying, you know, that even uh, Ethereum 2.0, even though it has a much, much, much um, uh, larger capacity, uh, it will still not be enough, you know. So I think that these layer two solutions will continue to exist, you know, and um, they, they will just coexist with Ethereum. Uh, they will help Ethereum network to, uh, to scale. And um, yeah, I think that it, it, will, it will simply work, you know, because uh, whenever you have a, a technology problem somewhere, um, there are solutions, you know, being developed. So I, I see no problem for Ethereum in the future, you know. For okay. now, it has some problems with fees and so on, but this will be solved. Now, let's blur the lines a bit. Coinbase is very clearly a platform that allows people to trade coins. But then to blur the lines, what Coinbase did is get listed as a company on a stock exchange. <laughs> and so yeah. now I don't know whether it's a coin or a company. I don't know if it's on the blockchain or on NASDAQ. Can you clear that up? Yeah, so it's very simple. Um, Coinbase is a publicly listed company uh, and uh, it issued uh, shares or stocks uh, and it's not on the blockchain. Okay, so you cannot buy Coinbase coin. Okay, so it's just a share, just like, uh, you know, app, you, you just buy uh, uh, company shares or stocks and it's just like Microsoft, just like Apple and any other com publicly listed company. Okay, so uh, it doesn't have its own coin. Ah, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that. Okay, well, there is another blurred line, which is, I don't know whether it's a joke or whether it's legitimate. I don't even know if anybody knows if it's a joke or legitimate, but I'm sure you know about it. The beauty of the blockchain is that it smashes international boundaries. There's, you, you don't even know if you're trading in Slovenia or Canada or England because the question doesn't even make sense. If I'm going yeah. to buy a couple shares of Ethereum, then it doesn't really matter. I could be sitting on a beach 
in Iceland. I could be sitting on a beach in South Africa. It hardly matters. And yet the little island nation of Barbados has opened up an embassy in Decentraland yeah. in the metaverse. Now, is that mean, does that mean there's going to be a whole row of embassies in Decentraland, which is one of the metaverses? Does it mean it's just a joke? Is it just a publicity stunt? Because Decentraland actually gave it a grant in order to build its embassy. So I think it's just a publicity stunt for both Decentraland and Barbados. On the other hand, if I was a citizen of Barbados and I needed help and I was incapacitated somehow, instead of finding my way to a physical embassy, could I just go to Decentraland's Barbados embassy and order a passport and have it actually physically mailed to me? What's going on? Yeah, the metaverse or let's say digital worlds um, are becoming uh, you know, popular. Uh, maybe this is a fad, maybe this is a real thing we will see. But if you we, if we just take a look at what we are doing right now, uh, we, are, we are basically talking in metaverse. <laughs> um, 20 years ago, this would not be possible. You know, me and you communicating uh, uh, in real time uh, for basically for free, you know. Um, this is a metaverse, so everything is becoming digitized, um, <clears throat> and uh, embassies in uh, in uh, right, right now, you know, um, uh, the central land is one of the let's say metaverses, digital worlds where where you can uh, get your avatar and you can play in it and so on. You can basically enter and uh, play around. Uh, now, this is uh, this is one of the metaverse um, apps right now. Uh, we don't know what will happen in the future. Maybe there will be a lot of different metaverse apps uh, in, in coexistence. Maybe one will become a very dominant force. Um, but uh, creating um, or setting up an embassy in, met, uh, in, met, in one metaverse is just one step. You know, It's just the first step. We don't know where it will lead, but probably um, this, will, this is the future. You know, And maybe in the future, uh, you will be able to... Uh, uh, to sort out a lot of uh, different issues uh, in, uh, in, let's say, digital worlds or in metaverses uh, that you are now uh, solving in the real world. So <clears throat> it's a first step. Maybe it's a publicity stunt right now, but uh, everything needs to everything needs to begin with the first step. You know. Uh, so um, yeah, it's a first step. We don't know where it will lead, uh, but somebody needs to uh, to take the first step. <laughs> Okay. You are now far wiser than you were just a few minutes ago. Click on Meta in order to subscribe to my channel. And please click on this video, which is my most recent video, my previous one. And please click on that video, which Google and YouTube think is the most appropriate if you enjoyed this video.